I'm happy to talk today about how do you make biochar and the scales of production. Um, I'm an extension assistant professor, extension forester here at Utah State University. I chair the Utah Biomass Resources Group and the Utah Prescribed Fire Council. I have a, most of my background is in consulting forestry and, and fire, prescribed fire, that sort of thing. So I'll come at it from that perspective. Um, and here are our partners. Uh, as an extension, uh, cooperative extension specialist, I do almost nothing without partners. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Research uh, Station is another partner I haven't listed here, but um, my partners are super important to everything that I do. Oops, going the wrong way. Why is that happening? Let's try that. Um, the things I want to talk about today, I want to introduce uh, the simple kilns that we've been uh, referring to uh, through our presentations here. Um, talk about how to operate the kilns, show you how to make biochar right in your backyard or on the farm or out on the ranch, out in the logging job. I'm going to talk a little bit about more high-tech pyrolysis approaches and gasification approaches and, and try to wrap it up by bringing these things together at the very end. Uh, this is an Oregon kiln. Uh, Kelpie Wilson, who is one of our uh, participators, introduced me to this idea at uh, a conference in uh, the biochar conference in Corvallis, Oregon, about 2016. I was able to get a USU extension grant to have Kelpie bring four of these kilns to Utah and give us a first workshop on how to, how to operate them. And I've been running with those ideas ever since. Thank you very much, Kelpie. Um, I've done, I've taught a couple hundred, maybe 300 or more people in Utah how to do it uh, with these kilns at, at various scales that we'll talk about. Um, so this is a five foot by five foot kiln. Uh, I call them simple kilns. Sometimes they're called uh, flame cap kilns as well. So you can see we're operating them in pretty heavy fuels in a, in a dub fur forest uh, in central Utah. Um, and another, I scaled down this kiln. I think Kelby might have some small ones as well to a four foot by four foot. This way it fits in the back of my little pickup and I can drive to Longmont, Colorado as I did a year ago uh, in this photo and taught uh, Longmont City how, uh, in their recreational department at the request how to operate these kilns and start to make biochar in their ground. And we're working on grants to, to, to expand that project. And uh, after Kelpie got me started, my next interest is uh, getting this scaled up uh, to a little bigger thing that we might be able to use on logging jobs and such. And so I created these big box kilns is what I call them. This is a 12 foot long kiln. So I call it the BB12 big box. It's 12 foot long. Uh, it's six foot wide and four foot tall. Here we are operating um, uh, in Russian olive uh, is our feedstock in Moab, Utah. We're within a hundred feet of the Colorado River here in Utah. You're not supposed to burn open piles right uh, within the stream management zones. And so this provides an alternative to that approach. Here's you, yours truly, uh, my little cameo, uh, lighting uh, a kiln, one of my big box kilns, BB12. But I want to show that has, you can see here in this photo that this has double walled construction. As uh, one of our colleagues from Oregon, Ken Carloni, I'll mention in a, in a little while, and Kelpie pointed me towards this. One of the advantages of double wall construction, more e even heating within the kiln, more even biochar production within the kiln, but also it makes it easier for firefighters to work up next to. Uh, don't, uh, it's not so hot. Um, I started off actually with the BB-16, a 16 foot long kiln. This is it, our first uh, big box demonstration, just a few miles away from where I'm sitting here in Logan, Utah. Providence Canyon, worked the Logan Ranger District. Uh, uh, the, you went to Wasatch Cache National Forest to get us started. Here were uh, junipers, our main feedstock from a uh, wildland or a, a wildlife habitat uh, restoration project. This kiln is 16 foot long, uh, eight feet wide and six feet tall. Originally it was six feet tall. It's really hard for the firefighters to see down into um, all this, these, these big box kiln project, I should say, is, 
is supported by Utah Public Lands Initiative. So working a lot with the Forest Service, the BLM to kind of figure out this approach. And, and in some ways I like to laugh and kid myself, uh, you know, rednecks have been burning in dumpsters for a long time. This is nothing new, but it's, it's a little modification of that approach, slightly more refined. Um, and found that, you know, one of the things we found that a six foot kiln, although can handle a little bit more, uh, material it's harder to work with so I eventually had this cut down to four foot tall and that makes it a lot lighter easier to move around with a, with a pickup truck that's a single wall design uh, that, that that kiln that weighs about 2300 pounds um, so and the BB-12 weighs about uh, a little less than that 2000 pounds so we can move them with a, with a regular pickup even drag them around the site with a small excavator or a, a Toyota um, uh, we, one of the things we proved, uh, we're also working with you into Wasatch Cache. This is more recently, this is the fall of the, just last year, on the Heber Camas Ranger District, where, where we were assigned to uh, reduce hazardous fuels that were up to 30 inches diameter, almost all large diameter logs. The firewood cutters and the, and the log uh, harvesters had their way with these piles, and we, we we worked with what was left and I'm happy to see to say that these, the kilns were great for this, this operation. One of the surprises, one of the big worries I had going into this is are we gonna burn up excavators? Are they gonna melt their hoses and that sort of thing? Of course, it takes uh, careful operation and common sense by the operator, but they're surprisingly resistant to that. I envisioned we needed a special stirring stick and spent nights worrying about that sort of thing, but that, that turned out to not be a problem with this approach. So now I'd like to teach you just the process and this applies at all scales. You can do this in a coffee can with little sticks or you can do this in, in a hole uh, dug with an excavator much larger than my big box kiln. And I'll show you some other approaches after uh, I show you the, the process. So we load the kiln. Uh, if we're dealing with logs, uh, we build a rick of logs that is to say crisscross pattern. So we have good oxygen down in there to get things started. Um, dry feedstock works best, but my colleagues in Western Oregon do this uh, with a little smaller diameter material, but very wet right off the logging job feedstock. Um, so yeah, we can, here in Utah, this is Aspen mostly we have in this kiln, easy to get away with dry Aspen up to 10 inches of diameter in these small kilns. Um, and it doesn't have to be logs, it can just be small brush. Here we're working in juniper, a uh, little bit of oak brush, uh, can be branches. So either way, we start by filling the feed, uh, filling the kiln kind of overloaded with feedstock. And one of the advantages we like is everybody can get involved. Utah is a pretty family oriented state. So get grand, grandpa and the kids out there doing this on the ground. Um, and here's just a kiln ready for ignition. Uh, this is in Russian olive feedstock. This is uh, the demonstration that Kelpie got us started with in Draper, Utah, pretty urban environment. In fact, in the background is the Utah State Prison, which made it a little challenging to do this. Uh, think about it if you're, if you're locked up, seeing open flames is not very comfortable for you. Uh, but it kind of shows that even though we had 40 mile an hour winds today, you can see the windscreens that we had around. This is a pretty practical operation. We can do a lots of conditions. So we have all the small fuels on top and we top light the kiln. That's an important part of it. Uh, you can use a propane torch, a drip torch, or just some newspaper and a lighter, any of the above. And after you get it going, you want to stir to mix the fuels. Of course, it's important to point out safety uh, guidelines. You got best to wear gloves, eye protection, hard hat, fire resistant clothing. We do this on the ranches uh, and, and with, you don't have to have Nomex clothing, best not to wear polyester clothing, cotton or wool, something that won't burn up. Uh, a dust mask can be useful, especially later in the process, mostly common sense for, for safety. Um, here we're looking down into the kiln about mid process. It's not ready for the next step of quenching yet. We're just letting the fuel the, 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 the fuels cook down. 
Um, and I talk about a lot, we call these flame cap kilns. So what happens is after we get them going, uh, they're sealed all around the edge and a cap of flames forms over the top of the kilns. And almost all my photos, you'll see very little smoke coming out of the kiln. All the combustibles are consumed as they rise up through this cap of flames. And I've had some monitor air quality monitoring equipment next to my big box kilns uh, several times and found no change in air quality because uh, yeah, all the heat is going up and, and most of those combustibles are consumed. It changes like when this person is about to put this load of, of fuel on, and we keep adding on those fuels until the kiln is almost full of coals. But when he does put that load on, you'll break that flame cap. You'll get a puff of smoke for a minute and then it'll resume itself. And that if there's winds blowing at that time, that's where I found a few embers can, can spill out of the kilns. Uh, but for the most part, embers do not come out of these kilns, much safer and more controlled than, than pile burning. Here's a kiln almost ready to quench. So we have a layer of ash on top of the kiln. It's shifted from those previous photos from flaming combustion here to mostly glowing combustion. This is the time you want to quench. I'm going to point out ash that's on top of this kiln is not the same as biochar. It's got a very different content. It might have some other values, but that's not what we're making. But uh, we're going to produce a little bit of ash and a lot of that will get washed away during this quenching process. It takes about 70 to 100 gallons of water to quench these kilns. Here we are quenching and you stir. Part of firefighting and putting fires out is always stirring. It's kind of like making pancakes in the morning. You, you, if you don't stir your batter enough, you're going to have those little dry lumps. And you don't want dry lumps because they're going to hold heat. And here we're close to the finished product. This is a crude biochar that we've made reference to. Some biochars can, from high quality machines can, can be up to 90% carbon or upwards of 90% carbon. These are more in the 60% carbon. Partly because you can see these unburned, I call them bones, uh, these unburned materials that are in there. And you have choices what to do with those. There's a, there's a technique, a gardening technique known as hula culture. There's some market for those big bones. Ten, we tend to just throw those bones into the next kiln. Some strong backs to tip over a kiln. They have little holes in the bottom that we plug with a, a, a and some of them are round and I, I've kind of switched to making little square ones with a little sliding dog door for all of my kilns. They don't plug up as much. So you can let the water out of them before you, you, you tip them over. Here we are uh, using a mini excavator to tip a big box kiln. This is a 3,000 pound kiln plus all the material that's in it, or two, excuse me, a 2,000 pound kiln. So strong enough, a uh, little mini X can handle that. You can see the firefighter quenching as we tip the kiln. And more about safety, you always want to build a little fire line around the kilns. Uh, I mentioned embers. Uh, it was in that site where we had a few embers escape. Uh, there in the background, but we're e easily able to control them. Um, you always want a charged hose. That's a, a, a hose full of water with more ready to go when you're doing this for, for fire safety. And always confirm that all the fire is extinguished at the end. We, in firefighting, we call it cold trailing. It's essentially taking your bare hand and running it through every square inch of everything. Start with the back of your hand so you don't burn your palm, but you get pretty used to this. And uh, it's the only way to confirm that the fire is out cold. We've mentioned the benefits of biochar on the forest floor. I'm not gonna go too far into that, but that's an important part of our approach. And, in reference to scale, this is a friend of mine, in Logan, in his backyard. This is a simple fire pit you can buy at Lowe's for social uh, entertaining and that sort of thing. He makes his biochar in this. He's, he's just about to quench it. Um, I've uh, given demonstrations. This is in Boulder, Utah, down in Garfield County, just using what they had available. At the time, I could not bring one of my kilns down and they had this old watering trough that, that worked just great. And I want to point out in this one, we're right next to homes, gardens, uh, cars, not usually a problem. This is Kelpie Wilson's Ring of Fire, uh, excuse me, Deluxe 
Ring of Fire. It's got a, a double wall construction, very portable, very practical approach that, that Kelpie has landed on. And, and all of our different colleagues around the West, we kind of come up with our own little different approaches. This is a uh, retired forestry professor, Ken Carloni from Umqua College, who's built these new kilns. He just shared these photos with me. And uh, we're, uh, this is a double wall construction and you can see it in the back of a pickup. So pretty easy to break down and move around. I, I like this approach. I have not played with it, but I intend to. This is one of the more uh, productive and, and perhaps at this time, our biggest producer in the Four Corners States area. This is biochar now out of uh, Berthoud, Colorado, James Gaspard uh, operation I got to visit after I was in Longmont last year. These are pretty simple kilns, but on top of them, you see pretty high level technology for emissions control. In particular, uh, he's able to control uh, carbon monoxide with this approach, which can be pretty important. Um, one of the advantages of these simple kilns is they re require less feedstock preparation, less chipping. Chipping costs can be huge, but we do produce just crude biochar. And as you can see here, these it's less consistent piece size as if we uh, chipped it in comparison. But this person used plans to use this uh, in a tree nursery, so can have some agricultural uh, applications. Again, high tech kilns tend to use. Uh, chipped material, so it's more consistent piece size and, and higher quality biochar. Some of the, this is a chipping operation up in the Curlew National Grassland, the Russian olive. In some cases, we spent more money to chip the wood than we did to pyro pyrolyze it with our high tech or high tech kilns. This is a high tech kiln that I started with, a, mobile, a pyrolysis machine. It's stationary here, it's Amaron Energies. Um, it's a small it's lab scale sort of thing, and a half ton per day input, but this is sort of what got us started. We took that and made it mobile with Forest Service and BLM money and, and toured it around the West. Here we are in Bingen, Washington uh, at a mobile pyrolysis cook-off that we we're fortunate to win. And, 2017. We scaled that up to this medium capacity kiln that can handle about 20 tons per day input. Um, that's a, a loaded log truck is about 24 tons uh, to give you a feel for that scale. This is a sun grant that allowed us to do this. So what we're looking at is the inside of the reactor, a, a 24 inch diameter tube that's a rotary pyrolysis kiln. This tube is always turning and superheated from the outside and, and uh, cooks the bio, the, the material in the absence of oxygen, which is what we're doing in all these cases. This is how we make biochar. Um, when we're, you see the burning in our simple kilns, it's the wood on the outside or even in the outside of the log that's burning and the char is being produced further down in the kiln or further down in the log. And uh, so that tube that you saw and that former photo is mounted inside of this super uh, insulated and heated jacket that makes the biochar. And that was a mobile operation. Um, uh, some of the larger scale operations in the West, I thought perhaps Titan Clean Energy is uh, some friends of mine I got to, uh, from Canada, actually focused more, I learned yesterday, on, on higher quality char than high production, but there are some higher production operations around the West up in Montana. So to briefly mention gasification, this is a very small scale gasifier that we started with uh, in the Utah Biomass Resources Group in, in 2011. And we produced a small amount of char, but mostly focused on electricity. And it, we learned a lot, but it wasn't the most practical approach. But gasifiers can be quite large and there are some industrial gasifiers producing commercial amounts of biochar in California and other states. We, one of the lessons we learned there is that gasification is pretty tricky compared to uh, some of these other uh, technologies that we're using. Uh, this is a BLM site out in the Uinta Basin, uh, a mining site where I ordered a, a semi-load of char from Colorado at the time it was Confluence Energy. So the, just to point out that, yeah, you can order a semi-load of char for recreation or for restoration projects that is available uh, in this part of the West. 
and Deb talked quite a bit uh, about our, our approaches. I got to work with Deb and others of the Payette National Forest. Uh, here we are putting those large fuels down, we're repiling to make biochar. Instead of lots of times those large fuels get thrown into the pile anywhere. And here we're protecting those forest soils and we're gonna put all that small material up on top of, of uh, sort of that corduroy of, of logs you see in front of the excavator there. I wanna point out the history. We've been making charcoal in Utah for more than a hundred years. These are, uh, these are actually just over, just over the, wine, the line in, uh, state line in Wyoming. These are historic beehive shaped charcoal kilns. So this is nothing new. And this is, I got to go to uh, Brazil two years ago and, and give a similar presentation at the International Union of Forest Research uh, Outfits uh, Present a uh, group and and what I learned there is there in Brazil they're using these simple similar to beehive shaped kilns uh, to reduce they don't use, they make they make charcoal there uh, for steel production and for they they, they prefer it for, for grilling and uh, got to work with Dr. Hansu Pan I think is is here in our in our room today uh, and together uh, Han kind of showed me that. Uh, ran some quick numbers just on the back of a napkin that uh, Brazil within uh, just a year used these simple methods to reduce, they don't refer to them as hazardous fuels, but that those, that's the language we use. Uh, they reduced more hazardous fuels, treated more biomass uh, in one year with these simple methods than actually exists right now and, and combine the state of California and Arizona. So, uh, I see this as somewhat optimistic in, in that we have a hazardous fuels problem we can't seem to get a handle on, but here, here's methods that, that we can get a handle on. So maybe this is a way to, to move forward. And finally, I uh, want to share that I, I was able to use some of these uh, local briquettes from Juniper that we made from one of our big box kilns. I went and picked out the the, the finest of the coals, the big chunks, and, and hosted a few friends and had uh, barbecued, grilled salmon, gr salmon and chicken grilled with local juniper coals. So that could be a, a little side market for some of this material. And that's all I have. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, to, uh, uh, Darren. You know, I was thinking about those um, beehive kilns, and if we could get that restarted again, we could give a whole new meeting to the beehive state. Right. Well, we'll jump into the questions and uh, spend the next 15 minutes or so. Um, it's not noon here in Arizona yet, so I'm doing okay. And, uh, and th just that's it. So, Darren, you had a chance to look at some of those questions. Why don't you um, jump into some of them and give us some of those answers there? Sure. Um, I tried to just fill in. I wasn't sure if we were going to have the opportunity, the timing. So I tried to fill in some of the answers uh, in the chat pod. But one of the questions that was asked is how is a flame cap kiln different, uh, or a big box kiln different from um, an air burner? Uh, air burners. Well, a, a big box kiln costs about 6,000 bucks and air burner costs about 50,000 bucks for starters. Uh, air burners are not uh, set up right off the bat to make biochar. They're great for reducing hazardous fuels, um, but uh, unless you have something like the char boss that Debbie referred to, you won't be, or some other modification on an air burner, you won't actually be making char. Um, no moving parts on a uh, big box kiln. Those are some of the main differences between those. Um, Eva Stricker asked a great question um, and Deb touched on it briefly, uh, but it sort of doesn't make sense that biochar is charcoal and we're gonna leave it on the forest surface and it's gonna reduce hazardous fuels and wildfire danger. But uh, unless you think about, especially if that char is small size, small piece size, it's gonna work itself Pretty readily down into the forest soils. Um, in agricultural settings, we've seen that if a char is less than two millimeters or so, within a year, you, you won't even be able to see it on the surface. It'll work itself pretty far down into the soils. 
So that's kind of that method. And after a few years, even the char that's sitting on the surface, it can reignite, but it's probably going to, uh, it'll be, it'll be working itself into that uh, organic horizon. Um, Uh, there's some questions about snuffing lids uh, and, and can we snuff kilns without using water? The answer is yes, you can use a lid if it's in, and Kelpie, thank you, pointed out, it's got to be really tight fitting, uh, which must be the problem I had uh, the time I tried a snuffing lid on, on my big box kiln. I partly have them for safety. If wind picks up and I need to shut down for some reason, I, I can just lid it and walk away. Um, but we lidded uh, a big box kiln overnight in Moab from one of the photos uh, those demonstrations that you saw did a terrible job, obviously, because we came back in the morning excited to have, you know, cooled and completed char. We opened up the lid, it put oxygen right back down in the kiln, things started burning again. It's like we, I don't know, just stalled it overnight. It wasn't that practical for us, but in a sense, it was practical because it allowed us to stall it overnight and not have to necessarily quench at the end of shift, which is when we tend to tend to quench at lunchtime and at the end of shift, uh, just for practicality uh, to get the firefighters a break. But uh, uh, that's how that went. Um, you can use soils and even a wet canvas blanket for quenching char, uh, but it just, it can be more difficult. Uh, it's not easy hauling in water. Uh, sometimes you just do it with ATVs and that sort of thing, but uh, it's definitely the easiest way to quench a, a kiln 